Welcome back. Uh, today, we're going to begin our first unit of the Network of Exchange uh, Unit 2 of the AP World Curriculum uh, in dealing with the Mongols. We'll hop back in our next video to deal with all the trade routes uh, taking place in the world. But to start off, the connections that the Mongols are going to bring, and according to the College Board curriculum, the making of the modern world. So why are these guys such a big deal? First, we're going to deal with the AP World theme of governance. Um, and what you guys need to know is that in this time period of 1200 to, to 1450, we're going to see a number of empires collapsing around the beginning of the 13th century. And much of that is due to the, this up and coming power uh, called the Mongols. Um, these folks arise from a, a group of pastoral nomads in the Central Asian steppe, which is a region right about where you see the, those words Mongol empire. Empire on the map. Um, they are pastoral nomads. This means they uh, don't have any permanent home. They raise animals out on that steppe land and, um, and they will grow in the 13th century to create the largest land-based empire in human history. Uh, their origins on the Central Asian steppe uh, are as, as skilled horsemen and ranchers and archers. Um, and these, these uh, skills that they gain are going to allow them to both trade and sometimes raid neighboring groups in more settled civilizations. The Mongols have their beginning as a world power with Genghis Khan. Um, Genghis Khan is born Temujin, but after 1206, as he unites rival Mongol clans, he takes on the name Great Khan or, or Genghis Khan. Um, he's going to lead conquests in cities and states across the region that will resist his control. Uh, a lot of strategies like feigned retreats, uh, tightly organized military units, um, whisper campaigns where, where where survivors from conquered cities will be sent to, to neighboring cities to let them know of the danger that the Mongols possess in hopes of getting cities to just give in before the Mongols ever get there. Um, as new cities are conquered, as new regions are conquered, leaders and aristocrats are often killed, but others in the community are incorporated into this Mongol empire. Um, the Mongols are going to use technologies from the places that they're conquering. Uh, the Mongols, I, I like to often think of as, as not necessarily builders of, of civilization, but borrowers of civilization. So they're going to take ideas from the various places that they conquer and use them to expand their conquest further. For example, siege engines to, uh, to batter down um, uh, walls of cities. Uh, Gunpowder uh, that they get from China will be used throughout Mongol conquests further to the west. Once the Mongols create this massive empire, uh, we'll enter into a period of the late 13th century known as the Pax Mongolica or Mongolian Peace. Uh, they've got a new capital city, so the Mongols, some of them, begin to settle down and become more sedentary. Um, there's a, a tolerance for different religions within the Mongol Khanates. Uh, the Silk Road, which we're going to talk about more in another, uh, another lecture, the Silk Road will be made safer for trade as we see in more productive for trade as we see different regions united now under one rule the roads will be policed you don't want to go stealing from Mong the mongols during uh, during this era uh, tolls and taxes that might have existed at different points along the silk road will be eliminated as as now the entirety of this trade route will be under mongol control the Mongols will support infrastructure improvements along the Silk Road. That word infrastructure is an important one to know. It's, it's basically the underlying structure of a society that, you know, in today's world, we're talking about roads and bridges and the electric grid and the water systems. For the Silk Road, this is literally just improvements to trade route, uh, to the trade route to make it easier and safer for merchants to travel along it. And with that said, the Mongols do give a high value to merchant activity. Remember, these are Mongols from the Central Asian steppe. They don't have a lot of their own manufacturing and, and things like this. These were things that they often had to trade with settled civilizations in order to get. So merchants are very valued within the Mongol society, unlike traditional China, where in Confucianism, merchants might be considered as, as a lower social status or the mean people, according to Confucius. 
the after Genghis Khan dies, his massive empire is going to be divided uh, amongst his sons and, and grandsons, and then they will continue to expand the Khanates even further. Uh, so this is a strategy that we see in, in many parts of the world. For example, we talked about the Inca, who will take a massive Incan empire and divide it into, into provinces. Now, these Khanates over time will be uh, ruled more separately, and oftentimes we're going to see some rivalries develop. Uh, between these these sons, um, and it tends to, as over time, it'll be a less cohesive unit. Uh, military success for the Mongols is certainly not guaranteed. There are going to be some setbacks. The Mongols are stopped in the Middle East by the Mamluks, that, that Turkic ex-slave army that rules Egypt and the, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. They will be uh, unable to get into South Asia and Southeast Asia, so no Indian conquest, no, no Vietnamese conquest by the Mongols, largely because of the terrain is just not as conducive to the, the uh, types of attacks that the Mongols uh, Mongols displayed. Uh, they will have a failed attempt to attack Japan. Of course, Japan to attack, you got to get on a bunch of boats and go across the Sea of Japan. And, uh, and for the Japanese, they credit uh, kamikaze, these divine winds that will destroy the Mongol fleets. Basically, bad luck, there was a bad storm, and it hurt the Mongol fleets. Overall, the Mongol Empire is really a short-lived empire, only about 100 years as, as a united cohesive group. A uh, lot of infighting amongst leadership, and, and over time, as, as leadership weakened, revolts and uprisings of conquered people will ultimately topple the Mongol Khanates. We're going to give a closer look to one of those Khanates that we see in, uh, in East Asia, and this is going to be known as the Yuan Dynasty in, uh, in China. So this is Mongol rule in China, foreign rule in China. Uh, for most of the Yuan Dynasty, we've got a, a ruler named Kublai Khan. He's Genghis Khan's grandson. Um, the, the Mongols are going to bring an end, temporarily at least, to Confucian bureaucratic rule in, in China. But that doesn't mean there's not a bureaucracy. The Mongols are just going to bring outsiders, particularly Persians, into, uh, into China to help administer their government. Um, they'll move their capital further to the north. So the Chinese capital will land in a city that we today know as Beijing, the current day capital of China. Mongol women uh, will have a higher social status in China during this, this era than their Chinese counterparts. And ultimately, the Yuan Dynasty is going to be overthrown by the Ming Dynasty, a reassertion of, of Chinese rule over China. And as we'll talk about later, the Ming will return China to a more traditional Chinese Confucian style of government. With regard to economic systems, please know that the Mongols are going to expand their empire, which will facilitate Afro-Eurasian trade, trade all across the Silk Road, bringing new people together um, and, and bringing trade connections more easily between distant parts of this map. Uh, the Mongol conquests are going to link regions of the Silk Road, increasing trade along these routes and increasing the spread of innovation and ideas across these routes as well. We will talk about that again in a later video. With regard to cultural developments and interactions, one, there's a typo there. You guys can throw that in the comments and let me know that I've got a typo there. Um, what you need to know is uh, with regard to, uh, to the Mongols and, and cultural spread is that the Mongols connecting different parts of the world is going to encourage and foster the spread of technology and cultural ideas. The Mongols often adopted uh, the religion of the region that they're going to, to, to occupy. So many, many Mongols will pick up Buddhism in China. Many Mongols will pick up Islam in uh, the Middle East. The Mongols are going to facilitate the spread of, of developments like uh, paper money, which was a Chinese invention throughout the uh, Khanates. The Mongols are going to spread technology like gunpowder, paper making, printing uh, to the West. The Mongols will adopt a, a, a Uyghur script. This is in what is today Western China, a Uyghur script for their own writing. The Mongols did not have a writing script um, before um, their conquests. And so now they're going to adopt that. So what do we want to take out of this? Um, the big three, the Mongols are going to unite more of the world than has ever been united before this time, bringing greater cultural exchanges between regions. 
um, ideas, technology, religion, and we'll talk soon about disease are going to spread more easily from east to west and back again. The Mongol rule is short, ultimately, but the impacts of the Mongols are tremendously long lasting. We'll see you next time.